Hey everybody, it's Grandmaster Ben Feingold here with Chess.com with the game of the day. Um, normally the game of the day is played, you know, usually between two super grandmasters at some reasonable time control. However, today this game was so exciting that um, Black was an anonymous German FM and White was American IM Teddy Coleman. And this was a three minute game just played on Chess.com yesterday for fun. So got to have fun sometimes. And Teddy Coleman knows how to have fun. I want to party with that guy, just based on the final position. So let's have a look at this really exciting game. Usually, the faster the time control, the more exciting it is. And this was a three-minute game. Now, Black played in very unusual fashion, which I actually like. I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying I like to do it. And in this position, Black started with the very unusual play, Knight d7. Um, there's nothing wrong with knight d7. And here, black really got into it with the move h6. Now, sometimes when they play h6, they're just trying to stop bishop g5. So we're going to see a very normal game where white, uh, where black plays an old Indian style, like knight f6, e5, bishop e7. Just a normal old Indian where white can't play bishop g5. However, that was not black's intention this game. Okay, Black played the move g5, and Black continued to play in very enterprising style. Um, I guess White was afraid of g4, so he played h3. Black played bishop g7. Now, the good part of g5 is it's aggressive, and Black can start an attack, and the bad news is you're weakening your white squares here. We don't really have good control of that, assuming we had played more King's Indian style, like g6. Okay, e4, white just plays very classically. And now this is a very unusual idea to be played so early, but I've seen it before, just not so early in the game. Black wants to play the move knight g6 and control these squares with his knight, which obviously isn't legal now, and he played the move knight f8. That's why he's playing knight d7 so early. So black's giving up a lot of space in the center, but it is a three-minute game, it's very unusual, and I'm assuming this isn't the first time he's played this way where he's played g5, knight f8, knight g6. He's probably done that before. I do stuff like that, just not exactly this. Okay, and white just continued to play normal chess. Knight g6, queen d2. White's position looks great. White has more minor pieces out. White has control of the center. White has the pawns of the center. White's ready to castle if he wants. So obviously white has a nice advantage here. Okay, e6. He decided he wants to put his knight on e7, not on f6 to not block his bishop. Long castle. I mean, black played g5, so black's trying to attack over here. So castling queenside actually seems safer to me. And knight e7. Black gets to develop also. Okay, this is the first time in the game where I think white has to make a really big decision. Um, should white play on the queen side? Probably not, because he castled queen side. Should he play in the center, if possible? Problem is, d5 opens up the diagonal for the bishop and gives e5 to the knight. And e5 is difficult to play. It loses a pawn, because black has all this defense, and it gives away the f5 square. Well, if you're not going to play on the, on the queen side or the center, the, the king side is left. So... Teddy Coleman played h4, which is engine approved, and that more or less forces Black, in my opinion, to play g4. Um, the engine says basically every move gives White a big advantage, but I'm not going to take this and have an isolated pawn and open up my opponent's rook. I'm, I'm just not going to do that. So g4 is, you know, the idea when you play g5. Okay, and now Teddy played a great move. Now White's better no matter what he does, but instead of moving his knight, he played the move h5. This is positionally and tactically very strong, and times in my games when my opponent plays g5 and I play h4, like in this game, if they play g4, I always want to play h5. I want to separate their pawns from each other. I don't want black to play h5 and have this nice you know, pawn thing there. So I like h5 because if the knight moves away, then my knight has even h4 to go to, as well as the plethora of other squares. And then this pawn on g4 is pretty weak, 
and my queen and bishop make a nice battery. So I like to move h5. So I like what black did. Black tried to punish h5 by taking the knight, take here. I think you have to play knight takes g6. I don't, I don't want him to go here. Okay, so knight takes makes sense. Take, so material's equal, but white has a nice center. White has open h and g files. So I don't see black castling king's side. It's hard for black to castle queen's side because his pieces are in the way. And you know, white's gonna push, you know, white's got a big center. So this looks really good for white. Okay, queen f6. This makes it easier for black to castle because his queen's out of the way. And he's, you know, sort of half pretending he wants to take this pawn. White could play f4, which is an excellent move. But Teddy decided to develop his last piece. Bishop d7. Now, Teddy played a move that I would play. Um, but the engine wants to play more aggressively. It wants to, you know, push all these pawns. But I, I like what Teddy did. He took a pawn. Um, I like taking pawns. Um, a lot of trades happen now. A lot of trades. Okay. And here, I really don't like the decision that Black made. Um, Black can either trade queens or not trade queens. And I think uh, in this position, with great control of the f4 square and control of the h4 square, the queen on this nice diagonal, and, you know, Black's position, I think, is pretty reasonable, except that he's down a pawn. It's a double pawn. I, I would just castle here. And then I would try to play rook h8. And, you know, I, I got, you know, I got control of, you know, a lot of, a lot of these, you know, I got some possibilities here. And conversely, this bishop isn't so good. So I'd rather have white because white's a pawn up, but it's a doubled pawn and white doesn't really have a, a big continuation. So that's why the engine didn't like taking on h6 as much. Okay, but black didn't agree. Black wanted to trade queens, which I wouldn't do. Play queen f4 check, traded queens. And well, now, I mean, I guess black doesn't have to castle. He can play king e7 and move his rook over, but it's white's move. So white's gonna start doing stuff first. He played king d2, move your king up in the ending. He's gonna go to e3 later. King e7, rook g1. Obviously, if he goes to e3 now, knight g2 just forces him away, so. Stops that, takes the open file. Um, I don't like the move c6. That seems to make this bishop really bad. That that seems like it might even be called the losing move. That move I don't like. Okay, king e3. And now obviously you've heard a lot of grandmasters say bishops are better than knights. But I mean, I don't think this bishop is better than this knight. If that knight could stay on f4 the whole game, that would be pretty awesome. It's in, black, it's in white's territory. Um, but okay, white's trying to kick it out. But this bishop, I mean, where's that bishop going to go? It's blocked by all these pawns. So I'm, I'm in no hurry to take this bishop. I like what black did here, e5. The only thing good about white's position is white is a pawn ahead. And some would argue, not me, but some would argue the pawn doesn't matter because it's a double pawn. I don't argue that, but, you know, it's not a full pawn. Okay, now Teddy played an excellent move. And this is a move that you want to play in a lot of these positions where you see this pawn structure. You want to bust up Black's pawn structure because this is really good. That knight on f4 is going to stay there a long time. And the way the pawns are situated, the bishop is, is just blocked. I can't get my bishop out. So this is an excellent move. And I've seen it. I, I can even quote you some very impressive Grandmaster games. The first one that comes to mind is Hubner versus Kasparov, which is 30, over 30 years ago, I think. But it's a famous game because Hubner beat Kasparov. And Hubner wasn't beating Kasparov very often. Probably the only time he beat him. It was in a King's Indian, and Hubner also played the move c5. And I've played that move in similar positions. I'm trying to destroy this pawn center. Obviously, <clears throat> we can't take on d4 because our, our knight needs to be defended. Okay, And once these pawns disappear from White's perspective, then we can start moving these pawns and we really will have an extra pawn. So I really like this move. Okay, um, the engine doesn't like what Black did. He took on c5 and White takes on e5. That's the whole point. That's why you shouldn't take on c5. And now the Black Knight simply can't stay on f4 and White's gonna start moving his extra pawns on the king's side. And White has a lot of extra pawns on the king's side White has four pawns to one, okay? 
That's even more than lucky. That's more than fortuitous, which black has on the queen side. Okay, so he takes the bishop because his knight can't stay there anymore. And these pawns are just too strong. There's too many of them. So that's why d takes c was a mistake. Now, black's not a grandmaster. Black's not an IM. This is a three-minute game. This is move 23-24. Ah, black probably had a minute on his clock. So, all right. It's not, it's not a horrible mistake. It's a, it's a strategical mistake. Okay, so both sides try to get their pawn majorities going. That way, Capablanca can rest in peace. Okay, c5, f4, c4, f5. Everybody's pushing all of their pawns. Unfortunately for black, white has more pawns. Four to one is better than four to two. Okay, rook h8, finally activating the rook. And we have a really funny situation here, forcing f3. And the idea is to get to the seventh rank. And white didn't care about giving those pawns away because white is winning on the king's side. Maybe if white was Karpov, then he wouldn't have played f3. He would have played some boring move so that black doesn't get counterplay. But this is a blitz game and white isn't Karpov. So he's like, all right, all right, get your counterplay. I'm going to win anyway. It doesn't matter. Okay, f6 check. And, well, this would actually be fine if he plays king e8, uh, rook g8 is checkmate. It's, the truth hurts. Okay, and then f4, we got more pawns. Rook h1, threatening mate. Knight f5, a.k.a. knife f5. Now, once again, white's threatening checkmate. Going to play knight e7 check. The king has to go to f8 and then mate. Well, there's no way to stop that except taking the knight. Okay. And now um, there's a theme to this game, which I haven't talked about because it's a surprise. So white had double pawns and white had triple pawns, which he has now. Stay tuned. And black plays the move. Rook takes a2. So black actually has more pawns than white now, um, five to four. And black has four connected past pawns. However, white's pawns are further advanced and more dangerous. And this is something that I talk about a lot in my Rook and Pawn Endgame lectures. When you have positions where both sides are trying to queen their pawns, which is almost always the case in an endgame, your king is not a good defender. Because your king gets checkmated when you're trying to stop the pawns from queening. Okay, white's king... Never getting checkmated. Never. Black's king, 50-50, right? Black's king has nowhere to go. So this is very dangerous for black, okay? And black queening, I don't see it. It's going to take five or six moves. White queening, two or three moves. And the worst part, it's white's move. And white obviously played e6, okay? So if you just count the pawns, you might like black, but black's pawns have no chance of queening, White spawns are definitely going to promote, and black might get checkmated in the process. Okay, I got two pawns on the sixth and one pawn on the fifth, and you have one pawn on the fifth. You, you got no chance. Okay, so he gave him a spite check. The king moved out of check. He played rook here. Doesn't really matter. Now, a funny way to win the game, but definitely not as funny as the actual game, but it's a little bit funny, is e7, threatening you know to promote with mate. Rook e2 check, king f3. And to me, this is funny because there's nowhere to go on the e-file, which is sort of shocking, okay? A friend of mine in Michigan used to say, triple pawns are three times as good. Okay, I'm not sure if he was kidding. So the rook can't go here, can't go here, can't, can't go anywhere, okay? And e7 is actually the engine move. Luckily, Teddy Coleman has a very good sense of humor and didn't play e7. And if he did play e7, this would not be the, well, maybe. I don't think it would be the game of the day. I don't think so. Because it's, you know, it's a blitz game. It's an IM versus an FM. It's not, it wasn't in a big tournament. Probably wouldn't be the game of the day. Probably not. But after the move he made, it's definitely the game of the day. Okay, you got to have a sense of humor when you play chess. And his move isn't one of the top moves because the engine's like, this is made and this is made and this is made. But if you're a human, this is definitely the top move. Okay, there's no doubt about it. He played the move, rook h8 check. Okay, confusing the audience, the audience being his opponent. You have to take it. And now you get quadruple pawns. Okay, and we have eight passed pawns. So all those pawns, nobody can stop them. And 
when you have a lot of doubled and tripled and quadrupled pawns, which is obviously rare, the king can't approach. The black king can't go any of these squares. Those are all protected. And f8 versus equals queen is unstoppable. So rook h8 check was definitely the most fun way to win because you're never going to see this kind of thing again unless you watch the game of the day videos that I make with chess.com. So rook e2 check, got to give a spite check. Um, now here's what's funny about this. I think it's funny. White has two legal moves here. I wouldn't lie to you. Well, maybe. And one of them loses. Okay? So chess is tough. This is forced mate for white if white plays the correct move. If white plays the wrong move, he's losing. Amazing, right? He played king f3 and black resigned. Because you, you can't stop me from promoting next move. Well, I guess you can play rookie three check. But all right. So I'm going to promote and win. So black resigned. An amazing game. But to show how amazing it was, I mean, that's a great final position, is could also play king d4, which looks like it's winning, but it loses. You can believe that. Rook d2 check, the rook goes to d8, and white loses. Because if white's king walks up to help his pawn, black can sacrifice his rook when you promote, and this pawn's going to queen. So the rook d is going to win for black. So white had to play king f3. Obviously he did, and black resigned. Well, that was the game of the day. It was Teddy Coleman, the great international master from the U.S. versus uh, anonymous German FIDE master. Man, if I was black this game, I would also want to stay anonymous because I don't think I would hear the end of it. So remember, um, quadruple pawns are four times as good. Mm. The truth hurts. This is Grandmaster Ben Feingel for chess.com. Hope you enjoyed that game as much as I did. And click on more videos to watch Game of the Days and more videos with chess.com. Until next time, bye everybody.